Okay. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, I have some time to speak about something. This episode is going to be shorter than the rest. Um, I have around uh, 15 minutes to get this idea out. So my mind kind of looked at reality and it saw its multidimensional possibilities and eventually kind of realized that we have a sort of relationship with that which appears as external and a relationship that which appears as internal. The internal phenomena is thought, external phenomena is matter. So in some sense, we are working with thought, or thought and matter as qualities of the mind. my own life there has been a sort, sort of existential shyness, I could say, a sort of <clears throat> transparency that I, I felt my intelligence had when it came to values of externality. That means it's like sometimes external things change and your sense of meaning shifts, and sometimes the internal meaning changes, which changes the external, like shifts the meaning of the external. So it was one of those moments for me where, like in, in my youth, where I was so, there, was, there wasn't this segmentation of the internal and external yet. And until there came certain situations where I discovered that myself would appear unnaturally. And, and, and sometimes you shy from dysfunction. It's as if the guy's not shy because he doesn't want to touch fire. You know, he's not shy of touching fire. It's like he doesn't want to touch the fire. <laughs> <clears throat> and so the psychology, especially of the youth, is that they are learning from how the world gives them feedback. <clears throat> it's all about how one stands in the moment and the thoughts that arise. I have had moments where the sense of self, the desires of the self, were kind of gratified. And there's been moments where <clears throat> externally things have become perfect, but in, in, internally there has been chaos running. It's as if it doesn't matter what I had in that moment, there was an inner kind of worry, an inner concern. It's as if where the value of life is. It's kind of like we all want to be investors, but we all start off investing in ourselves. And if you're investing in yourself, that means you're looking for a certain value and the evolution of that value. And so the life of the person is the evolution of a sort of uh, embodiment of value, as if the genetics have kind of formulated a sort of conception which they're walking toward. <clears throat> so sometimes the inner reality can restrict the outer, and sometimes the outer can restrict the inner. This is just natural. Just like there are laws externally, internally there are laws as well. It's about internal authorization and existential allowance and how experience defines the boundaries of its freedom. What that means is sometimes if, if we think that we have to choose, they said patience is a virtue because the patient man saw more. That's it. That's the virtue of it. You see more before you decide. Think of it this way, that <coughs> your, your body, your physical body is the cocoon, or even your voice is the cocoon, in which the butterfly uh, steps out of. And the butterfly is how the inner reality of the caterpillar to a metamorphosis becomes the outer reality of the butterfly. That means it's as if the energy transforms. 
it's as if we can never say is a caterpillar a butterfly or is a butterfly a caterpillar it's like a, one of those unique paradoxes because we see that at the end of its life the life of the caterpillar is the beginning of the life of the uh, butterfly so it's as if a death is a beginning a beginning is a death you see it's it's, it's the dualistic nature of reality and because it's dualistic, we separate ourselves from the world. <clears throat> that means, I think, the percentage of honest citizen that you see in civilization, on average, it's as if maybe people are being, at most, 15% honest in civilization. It's very rare to see a person 100% trust in civilization. Usually, we feel we have to watch for the, how the bushes in the distance move in case a tiger appears. You're, you're usually creatures that are alert. So a lot of our intellectual capacity, our communication ability has to do with our animalistic and instinctual alertness. You see your animal instincts are an, an instant dose of data that you quickly respond to something, but it's as if the, before you think about it, the pattern is there. <coughs> Kind of like there's a way you can categorize your subtler planes of abstraction where you have, you can create a relationship between an emotion and thought. And so what that means is one emotion can attribute to many thoughts or in some sense uh, uh, many emotions can be attributed to one thought. So you see there's, there, there's a sort of relationship that goes on in how you position the subjective architecture. For example, when I speak, every time I speak, it's like, literally, I can playfully imagine it's like structures are being built. It's as if in one of these lectures I do, like I feel like I'm building a city. <clears throat> That's a good way of saying it. And it's as if different sectors of how the intelligence observes the same thing must be acknowledged. What is our freedom? What are the limits of our freedom? How does the world change? What is the value of thought? Is it just personal satisfaction? Are philosophers just people who are just, uh, they're, they're playing with a toy when they think? It's not, it's, not, it's not the case. There's so many unknown dimensions that strangely Humanity can instantly unite under the banner of unknown. What that means is we stop discriminating the unknown, and so uniqueness gives, is given full authorization. <coughs> There's two explanations. You see, for example, you see many sh shy children nowadays, simply because their attention is used to consuming data rather than to the dialogue through technology. Okay, because they're consuming data through technology, they don't get the experience the, or the tonal remembrance. It's as if like a part of their brains do not activate because the human aspect of the dialogue or data transfer has become more technological data transfer. <clears throat> so kind of like my talks are coming somewhere in the middle of this. What that means is like they are, it's like a, I don't know how to say it, but like sometimes we can uh, fly beyond the earth and the sky.
They asked the wise man, what is life? He said, the unknown. They said, what is the unknown? He said, it is the unknown. They said, what is the known? He said, it is the unknown. And eventually there came the realization that the question and answer never existed. I find language to be something that you bring into life. <clears throat> this is a strange uh, statement, but I, I honestly mean it. That means when I, for example, speak, it's not per se going based on a word of, or, or, or a sentence. Like It's not like I have like this invisible screen where I'm reading off. It's, it, it, you know? There are times, of course, I look up quotes online, but like... <laughs> I'm telling you that it's it's one of those things where I realize the value of novelty. That means seldom this is said, but you cannot be original without sacrificing how you're not original. Your life will only change if the eyes of the mind change. And the eyes of the mind cannot truly change, or <clears throat> even if they change, it's prone to unconscious enslavement. But it's one of those things where you have to just know yourself. And when I say you know yourself, you have to realize how your intelligence is emerging as a sense of self-aware self. This is so this is so crucial. This is the study of it. It's as if the neurologists were like, holy shit. We, we came to the conclusion that the Upanishads made. That the seer that of the scene is unseen. It's like kind of like this, right? If, if we say that if you see, for example, in front of me, I see a computer, right? So when I see this computer, it's as if on some level I could say that's the computer and this is me seeing it. But the one, the, the awareness to the fact that I'm aware I'm seeing it is unspeakable. It literally moves beyond the language threshold. So at some point, neurologists are watching a phenomena that cannot be put into words. And that means either civilization has to step it up or uh, our thirst for knowledge has to step down. One thing that many historians probably wonder when they read history books is they will read certain moments where they see human beings could have done something differently and it's like, why didn't you try? And that is one thing that I don't want to say it's like this daunting internal experience, but it's this moment that certain moments throughout the day, it's like it could be random moments, like I'm drinking a glass of water, and then suddenly there comes this thought as if I'm wondering the children of our children's children's children kind of, I, I, in my mind, playfully visualizes like one of their voices saying, why didn't you try, or like, uh, where is it going? You know, it's like for me, questions have enlightened me more than answers. So I don't know what the hell the spiritual people are doing looking for solutions to their own mind. It's like, it's your eyes, buddy. Nobody can, nobody can um, turn your car around. You're the driver. This realization of the driver is the independence of consciousness. This independence of consciousness is based on certain universal observances. So what that means is you imagine right now, you forget everything. You just, for a second, you just wonder. You're like, okay, if I just opened my eyes, imagine this was a new moment, no past context. You would see an objectivity. You would see phenomena, like you would see phenomena, and you would see what part you play in the overall phenomena of the moment, pretty much what is in your conscious free will, right? Because I am, I am trying to protect free will from a sort of blindness to what technology can do. I, I, I see, I, it's as if you see the tornado from the distance. I see what's going to happen with technology. It's two options. Either man will, or either nature will devour technology or technology will devour nature or a new dimension will be built. It's so fascinating because writing is such a divine thing. Anytime a person just authentically writes something, <clears throat> when their mind authentically writes something, 
it's as if they their inner reality has managed to survive into the outer. It's very hilarious. Thoughts are trying to go from the inner reality to the outer. Matter is trying to go from the outer reality to the inner. That means a part of our brain is making matter, considering matter uh, as invisible, and a part of our brain is considering matter as visible. <clears throat> it's an association game. It's pretty much like in an empty vacuum, certain, uh, uh, like in space, you just do certain bowling balls in, in outer space. Imagine a bowling ball is just going in a straight line like forever, you know? So in that, <laughs> until it just pulls by gravity. But I'm saying like, it, it's one of those situations where you set into motion from the void the required reality. Then you stand in your that means this may be a strange thing. Most people are used to watching things outside. They're not used to watching the self. They're used to watching TV, watching their phone, watching everywhere. They can't just be still and silent for like 10 minutes. Minimum 10 minutes or at most like try for 20 minutes. Okay? And just sit still and silent. And literally there's no teaching. There's nothing. There's nobody wants anything from you. You're just sitting. And in that, in that seat of the moment... You start, as you stop being active, you see what was active. <clears throat> kind of like you turn off the key to the car, but you still hear the, the uh, engine's delay. Anyways, guys, thanks for tuning in. <clears throat> I have to end the talk here, but uh, uh, one thing I can say is that we are shy because we fear. We fear because we desire. We desire because we have failed to realize the void. And when we see the void, that's when we become an actual real human being. We're not afraid of the chaos. You just realize if it requires to define you or not in accordance to who you naturally are. So we are in a strange time where whether without realizing it or not, subconsciously there is an, a war of language going on. And what that means is human beings, their attention is being pulled by various ideas. And so in this war, the warrior has to be centered by itself. That means <coughs> uh, in a world of lies, you must unravel the truth of your much blessings and namaste.